heard you, my friends. You are sending our Liberal team back to work, back to Ottawa with a clear mandate. Tonight, Conservatives have put Justin Trudeau on notice. And Mr. Trudeau, when your government falls, Conservatives will be ready and we will win. And it is by being patient and through humility, and only at that price can we possibly say tonight that Quebec is us. Canadians sent a pretty clear message, a clear message tonight that they want a government that works for them. This is the best election result that any Green Party in any first-past-the-post system has ever had. What we managed to accomplish in only one year is spectacular. Hi there, and welcome to a special afternoon post-election edition of Power and Politics. I'm Vashi Capellos. We're coming to you from CBC headquarters in Toronto. Well, Canadians have spoken. The Liberals are heading back to Parliament Hill, but with a minority mandate this time and with a lower share of the popular vote than Conservatives. They also won't have representation in Alberta and Saskatchewan. Meanwhile, much of Quebec rejected all of the main parties and opted instead for the Bloc Québécois. So... What kind of ride are we in for? Time for a special afternoon edition of the Power Panel. In Regina, Jason Markasoff of McLean's joins us. Over in Montreal, David Ortel, former Quebec Liberal Immigration and Environment Minister. In our Ottawa studios, political commentator and former NDP MP Francoise Boivin. And here with me in studio, Melissa Lantzman of Hill & Knowlton Strategies and journalist Vicky Machama, host of the podcast, safe space. Hi, everybody. Hi. Nice to see you. I want to just, bef before we get into this post-mortem, let's pull up that, if we could, the, uh, the the picture of the House of Commons, because I just want to go over the number of seats, make sure our viewers are aware, again, of how many seats everybody won. The Liberals, of course, came away with 157 seats, so 13 seats shy of a majority. The Conservatives ended up 23 seats up from the last election at 121 seats, but of course, definitely short of a majority there. The Bac Québécois ended at 32. The New Democrats won 24 seats, the Green 3. And Jody Wilson-Raybould, the lone independent in the House, comes away winning her seat in Vancouver, Granville. So a very simple question to start us off, Vicky. I'll begin with you. If there's a headline to be written from your perspective about the outcome of this election, what is it? It's that Canadians didn't wholesale buy any message that any particular party was selling, that they didn't guarantee any majorities, and they were all very confident heading into the election and throughout the election. And what Canadians gave back to them was, we're not sold, you guys figure it out. Somebody come back to us with a better pitch and a better answer. And I think that's what those numbers tell us. And even if you look closely and break them down just by population, Canadians are divided on what the parties have to say. I don't necessarily extend it as far as Canadians wholly being divided, but on what the parties have to say, at least Canadians said it's a mixed bag for us. Melissa, what do you think? What's the headline for you? Yeah, I think judging by those speeches, the you know the headline that I think that we're supposed to take out of it is that everybody wins. But in fact, nobody <laughs> wins except uh, unless you're the bloc. I think there's a story there in terms of the the rise of the bloc. Regional division seems to be uh, seems to be the thing that's coming out of uh, yesterday. Liberals totally shut out of uh, two provinces. Uh, a big repudiation in Quebec from uh, from the bloc Quebecois, and that's a tough road forward for a government. David, what do you think the headline is today? The well, I, I think the morning after, you have to say, yes, a divided country, but Trudeau survived. Uh, I mean, uh, in, in this type of environment, I mean, you're talking about India, SNC-Lavalin, deficits, blackface, uh, stories left and right. He pulled it off. Uh, he is weakened, but it's a stronger majority, a minority government that anybody expected. I mean, over the weekend, uh, Andrew Shear was talking about, uh, well, if I have more seats, I should be the next one forming the government. Uh, we were looking at 130 seats, uh, 135 seats apart, uh, piece for both major parties. Uh, he did very well in Quebec. I understand, yes, the bloc did show very well, but remember, the Liberals had more, a bigger share of the popular vote than the bloc in Quebec and more seats. So uh, it's not uh, a, a big win for the bloc, and it's, uh, it's even lesser of a win for Francois Legault, the Premier of Quebec, who, uh, with his strategy of coming out on Bill 21 and making it a federal issue, actually a strategy uh, backfired, and now he has a liberal minority with the NDP having the balance of power. 
Yeah, I just want to add a little bit to the context and Francoise bring you in there where Quebec is concerned because it is true that at the beginning of this campaign, the Liberals had looked to pick up seats in Quebec if they were on a path to a majority. They didn't end up doing that, but they also didn't take the hit, to David's point, that that uh, that they might have with the bloc if the assumption, sort of if the, if the projections had held true on the top end. So the bloc was projected to take anywhere from 30 to 40 seats. They ended up with 32. That's, that is a significant pickup. I think they picked up about 22 seats, if I'm not wrong. The Liberals ended up losing only six in the end, which did contribute to the strength of their minority. What's the headline for you uh, out of all of that, Francoise? Well, uh, basically it was uh, buckle up, it's going to be a bumpy road uh, uh, ahead uh, for, <laughs> for pretty much everybody for all type of reason, notwithstanding all the rosy pictures pretty much everybody gave uh, after uh, after the night was was pretty much done. But uh, I, I do agree. Uh, thank, God, uh, thank God for small mercies because if the if the bloc had gone as far as we were starting to hear toward the end of the campaign, uh, which was uh, closer to 40, for even up to 44 seats, um, I, I do think it would have been uh, more hell to pay. Uh, so I thank the prime minister for reviving the uh, the bloc spirit with uh, with Bill 21. But at the same time, he, he kind of uh, uh, of lower the uh, the uh, cockiness of 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 the Bloc Québécois that will have to be a bit more uh, humble. Uh, so uh, it'll be interesting, different different uh, landscape, uh, landscape for sure in, in Quebec, but it'll make uh, things uh, a bit interesting. Jason, what about you? What's the headline? You were at Conservative headquarters last night, obviously, and you're normally based out of Calgary. What, what do you think the headline is? I mean, th th I, mean I, think, I think the national headline to be reductive is... Uh, Justin Trudeau is still prime minister. Um, here, I think out, out west, I think the, uh, the headline uh, can actually not be printed in the family newspaper <laughs> um, for, uh, for, for Saskatchewan and Alberta. Um, high 60 percentage of uh, seats uh, of votes in both provinces. The fact that there were more people who voted for the Conservatives in Alberta than in Quebec and every Atlantic province combined. Um, there is intense, uh, intense anger and uh, disdain out here um, for, uh, for the Liberals. Um, they don't have any seats between Winnipeg and Vancouver. Um, they're going to have to do some uh, serious, uh, serious um, uh, emotional repair and concrete uh, action. They're going to have to figure out how to address cabinet out here. But uh, again, the, the headline and people were feeling it in uh, the conservative headquarters is the liberals are still uh, liberals still have, have government. Um, you know, uh, Sheer talked uh, in his concessions, sort of concession victory speech that uh, now the liberals are on notice. This was always going to be a two a two election process. That's what we always thought. And so it is. And they're in a minority situation. Well, the Conservatives were leading in the polls nationally for most of this year after the SNC-Lavalin scandal. Um, he was gunning for a majority, and uh, he fell well short of that. Uh, the two uh, fellow national party leaders, uh, Singh and Scheer, are going to be facing a lot of uh, leadership questions today, uh, which Trudeau will not to the same extent at all. Yeah, there's two things that they mentioned that I do want to dig into. And the first is uh, what we heard from the various leaders since the results of the election came in, particularly through the speeches last night. Uh, Andrew Scheer insisting y y uh, last night and today, he just gave a press conference as well, that uh, framing this as uh, actually not a bad thing, that instead the, the Conservatives had picked up their share of the vote and they had won a hot, you know, more of the popular vote than the Liberals. And Mr. Trudeau framing this as a clear mandate, as we heard last night. I, I do want to dig into that. And I do also really want to dig into some of the regional outcomes, especially as you highlighted, Jason. And that's exactly what we're going to talk about after I take a very quick commercial break. We're back in two minutes with the Power Panel on this special post-election edition of Power in Politics.
When I spoke to Justin Trudeau last night, I urged him to take notice of these significant and troubling results. And more words and platitudes will not cut it. He must be willing to change course, to stop his attacks on the energy sector, and to recognize that when Western Canada succeeds, all of Canada succeeds. And to those in the West, I hear your frustration and your anger. Welcome back to an early post-election edition of Power and Politics. I'm Vashi Capellas, and I'm here with our power panel, Jason Marcusoff, Francoise Boivin, David Ertel, Melissa Lansman, and Vicky Machama. A reminder that we're streaming this special post-election coverage online on Twitter, YouTube, and Facebook, so you can send in any questions you have for our very esteemed power panelists, and we'll get to as many as they can. Just add your question to the comment section on any of those platforms. Uh, before we went to break and, and jumping off that clip there, Vicky, uh, the idea of regional differences and the way in which these leaders are talking about them, addressing them, perhaps uh, exploiting them for political expediency. What is your take on the reaction so far that we've seen from uh, particularly Justin Trudeau and Andrew Scheer following the outcome of this election? Well, we just heard what Andrew Scheer had to say, which is that there's serious reason to take a second look at Alberta and the prairies and to uh, harness or at least think through how issues affect them. Justin Trudeau in his concession speech tried to reach out and said, you know, we're, we're, we're paying attention, we're watching you, you didn't give us any seats, but we're keeping an eye on it. Uh, and we're gonna try to address that. How that will actually play out remains to be seen, frankly, um, you know, and it depends on what bills we're looking at. But at the same time, what I think this, this uh, brings up is how short shrift necessarily Alberta got during the campaign. Most leaders didn't spend that much time there. And so I think it, that it speaks to that, you know, they treated it as a sheer coronation and a coronation is effectively what he got, except for an Edmonton Strath Kona. Which brings me to the, my next uh, thought, which is that this Western alienation isn't just about typical Alberta. I think there are sections of Alberta, an increasingly young, increasingly indigenous, increasingly racialized Alberta, that doesn't necessarily accord with what's happening in Ottawa, but at the same time isn't necessarily responding to the disaffection that other Albertans are talking about. And so there's a broad swath of disaffection here, and I think the Liberals are going to have to seriously contend with that. I think that's a really significant point, and I think that's something that stuck out to me as well, and I'd love to just quickly bring in Jason before I head over to Melissa, because I think there's a perception among a lot of uh, commentators in this election that Alberta is a monolith, and that people there are all conservatives who think only one way, and they hate climate change, and I think, I, I mean, Jason was on the show last week after the this climate uh, Greta Thunberg's appearance there, and there were you know five upwards of five to ten thousand people who were out there. Uh, I think that's a, a really interesting point that Vicky brings up, Jason, about sort of the the way in which the disaffection cuts through multiple different uh, demographics and socioeconomic factors, a whole so sort of thing in Alberta. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, the NDP still have 20-some uh, seats in an 87-seat legislature. Um, they're still a significant, uh, major, uh, you know, opposition. Um, there was this one seat. They did, uh, the, you know, the Conservatives got 69% of the vote or so in Alberta. That's a lot, but that still means there's, uh, you know, 3 in 10 Albertans don't like what uh, Andrew Scheer, the Conservatives, are uh, selling and uh, this week we actually may uh, may see more of a shift in the way Albertans think about conservatives on Thursday Jason Kenney has waited till after this election to uh, release a budget that's likely going to have a lot of uh, cuts a very uh, a, a very big uh, deficit uh, attacking budget uh, that will have uh, reductions in many areas. Uh, we're expecting big hits for post-secondary institutions, and that could really shift the dial against uh, conservatives. But let's, you know, that said, um, there is there was profound disdain for Justin Trudeau and the Liberals uh, here in Alberta, or here uh, in Saskatchewan now, but in Alberta and in Saskatchewan. Um, the you know people really identity has become wound up in pipelines, in oil, um, and in the economy, and. Uh, and even even true even Rachel Notley, the NDP leader out here, tended to uh, blame and oppose uh, Trudeau on issues uh, like that from the right. Um, so Trudeau, uh, you know, knows that he is deeply unpopular. That he he inspired a huge um, swell in conservative votes out here uh, in Saskatchewan and Alberta, and he needs a serious, uh, you know, beyond uh, rhetoric, beyond a few lines in a speech, uh, he needs a serious way to figure out how to address this and how to calm uh, some of the tensions out here. 
And prior, Melissa, to last night, there was at least a little bit of representation at the table from Alberta vis-a-vis -vis Kent Hare at one That's point, right. Amarjeet Sohi. Uh, that, that does not exist in any capacity. There's no Ralph Goodell anymore. Like yeah. It's hard to, to overstate how much different it looks in Western Canada for the Liberals. How difficult might it be to do the kinds of things that Jason is talking about, to address the vote there. Well, look, not having them at the cabinet table is is one thing, and then there's a, you know there's a couple ways around that. Uh, but I'm not sure that uh, you know putting somebody in from the Senate at the cabinet gives them any legitimacy with uh, with any voters. This are this is difficult for uh, certainly for the prime minister. Um, you know, here's where Mr. Shear can get into some trouble as well. If you're if you're constantly seen as uh, you know as somebody who is protecting the interests of the West, and there's no question that you need to protect the uh, interests of the West that have given a, uh, you know, given the bit of middle finger, frankly, to the prime minister for not uh, looking, taking care of their interests, looking at their industries. The risk that Andrew Scheer runs on uh, on that is looking like a Western premier, where I think that he needs to grow the party uh, elsewhere, you know, in the next two years and leading up to uh, to the next election. Uh, they were shut out of uh, out of Ontario and, and, you know, the West can't take over every conversation uh, that we're having after this election. I, I think that's a really good point, too. And David, I wanted to bring you in there because uh, on our show, on our special last night, Corey Tanai, who of course ran the provincial campaign uh, in the last election for the Conservatives and then the 2015 campaign, and I think Andrew Coyne as well, I'm, I'm trying, it's all blending together, but they were, they were essentially looking at the same idea of growing the base. Clearly the base came out for the Conservatives, but it was not enough to catapult them to a win. They did not win the most seats. And if the, if the goal has to be to increase that base, is it, um, is it a fine line to walk uh, in addressing the types of things that Melissa talks about with Western Canada? David, what do you think? Well, if you look at Quebec, I mean, if you look f four months ago, six months ago, the Conservatives looked very good in Quebec. Uh, they had star candidates. One race, for example, you had Yves Lévesque as a star candidate in Trois-Rivières, who was mayor of Trois-Rivières up until December 31st, uh, 2018, for 17 straight years. He finished third last night in that race, and he was the favorite two months ago. And so what happened is that the, the social conservatism piece uh, came out and played horribly uh, in Quebec. Uh, the whole question on abortion, which was jump-started by another star candidate in Quebec, Sylvie Fréchette, uh, the fact that Andrew Scheer had very bad French debates, again on the question of abortion. There was no connection. Uh, the Quebec lieutenant for the Conservatives, Alain Reyes, who got reelected last night, even said it this morning in French media. He said the Conservatives did not connect in, in Quebec. And, and that harkens back to the way Brian Mulroney used to build that coalition where you could have Western Conservatives come together with Quebec nationalists and form that big tent progressive conservative movement and that's not just it's just not happening right now and so uh if if you are going to broaden the tent there are some opportunities because look in quebec yesterday 50 percent of quebecers voted for two parties that support trans mountain so this this thing that quebecers are all anti-oil is just not true it's a more difficult sell but it's just not exactly true that everybody's opposed to it. It's also not true in BC, where I note that a number of the liberal uh, liberal MPs, like Terry Beach, for example, who were supposed to be thrown out because of the, the liberals' support for buying TMX, didn't that didn't end up happening. Uh, Francoise, last word to you in this segment. Uh, what do you think about the regional differences and how might they affect what we see in Parliament going forward? Well, it, like I said at the uh, earliest, it's it's really a divided uh, country. But the real question for 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 Andrew Scheer, I think, and uh, and we, I've heard it. I I don't know how often, and I I got different type of answers. Uh, mine uh, might be different also. But is do you honestly believe that Andrew Scheer in in the next foreseeable time for the next election can beat Justin Trudeau? I don't think so. 
And I think conservatives will have to really think about this as they are facing, like, the whole country. I don't want the West feeling more and more alienated. Um, I, I, I don't want the country to be just about Quebec. Uh, something, something really bad could happen out of all of this. There's big decisions to take. And m my problem is, right now, when I look at the, at the uh, shape of this new parliament, is I don't know how they will be able to talk to each other. Uh, they've been su in such an adversarial mode throughout the campaign. The words sometimes leave some, 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 some scars that will be hard to, to, uh, uh, to get over uh, uh, with. Um, there's a lot of conservatives, more progressive, that are not exactly happy. How in the hell could Andrew Scheer lose an election against a guy who was plagued with, with scandals, who had not uh, delivered on some of his key uh, promises in 2015. It's, it's for so many people, so uh, unimaginable. So it's going to be a, a wake-up call after they get over themselves of having more, more, more big, uh, bigger percent, percentage of the, of the vote. When it's all concentrated, uh, concentrated in, in one or two provinces, uh, it doesn't mean that you represent the whole country. So they, they, they have a lot of uh, big decisions to take uh, considering that, uh, that impact so that they can all work together to bring all those different uh, uh, objectives from different regions. Uh, it's not an easy country to, yeah, to, and, to rule. And I, I do want to talk about the prospects for working together, but I first have to put the power panel on pause for a moment to check in with CBC's polls analyst, Eric Grenier. Eric, hi. Hello. It feels like this is the longest I've gone without seeing you. <laughs> Lovely to see you again. Uh, tell us what stood out to you. What are you taking away from uh, the, the results last night? Uh, well, the big picture, I mean, obviously the uh, Conservatives uh, winning the popular vote over the Liberals was something that the polls had suggested was uh, uh, something that could happen. And also that even if the Conservatives did get more of the vote, they wouldn't necessarily win uh, most of the seats, which is, again, what happened last night. But I think if we're trying to figure out just the broad strokes about why the Liberals, first of all, lost their majority and why the Conservatives didn't win uh, the most seats. Uh, I think you do need to look at, you know, uh, I've heard you uh, t talking about it with the panelists, but with Ontario and Quebec, because the Liberals lost support everywhere. They lost support in every single province. Only in Prince Edward Island did they not lose any seats. Uh, but they were able to hold on to a lot of their support in Quebec. They only dropped, I think, about six seats in the province. They only dropped, I think, one in Ontario. Uh, their vote actually held very firm there. And so the Conservatives took a lot of seats away from the Liberals in Western Canada, particularly in Alberta, you know, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, and B.C., uh, but they were just unable to make any inroads into Ontario. The GTA, we talked about how important it was. The Liberals swept all 25 seats in Toronto. The NDP did not turn out to be all that much of a factor in the downtown core of the city. And in the GTA, the, the suburbs around uh, Toronto, the Liberals had 25 seats going into it, and they came out of it with 25 seats. Uh, there's, there was just no chance for Andrew Scheer to become prime minister if he can't win that area of the country that is the swingiest and which decides elections. So I think that really tells a story about what happened last night. Can you, uh, t you touched br briefly there on the NDP. Can we delve into a bit more of their outcome? Because uh, I, I would argue the polls pretty much got it right everywhere. The only thing that might have been underestimated uh, was the NDP support. You had been looking and tracking throughout the campaign to see whether that support was as on the up as it appeared, whether it would hit a ceiling. What, what do you take away from that party's final result? Yeah, the last, most of the last polls had the NDP somewhere around 18 or 19 percent support, and they came in at 16. That is better than where they were at the beginning of the campaign, so Singh did have an impact and improve the NDP's fortunes because they started the campaign around 12 or 13 uh, percent. But I think that was one of the surprises, that their vote did not come out in some of the ways and some of the areas that we thought they might. Uh, when you saw the gains that they were making, for example, in a place like Atlantic Canada, you'd look at the map and say, well, maybe a seat like Halifax would be a seat that the NDP would be able to win. Instead, they, they were behind the Liberals by more than double digits. Same thing with uh, Toronto, like I said, uh, seats like Davenport. Uh, they fell just short in Toronto Danforth, in Parkdale High Park. They're again behind by 14, 16 points for the Liberals. So where, that in, where the NDP had a traditional base of support, 
it didn't really matter. It was the fact that they didn't have uh, their old popular incumbents uh, that were on the ballot anymore that I think made the difference. Because Andrew Cash came pretty close to winning Davenport, but the other New Democrats in, uh, in the rest of Toronto didn't come anywhere close. And I think that was one of the factors that gave the Liberals more seats than uh, we were projecting going into the night, is because the NDP vote didn't perform as well as we were expecting it to. I wonder also what the impact of strategic voting was, but I'll leave it there. Thank you, Eric. Thank you for your insights today and your work throughout the campaign. That poll tracker basically broke the internet yesterday. So thanks very much to CBC Polls Analyst, Eric Grenier. And this is a special afternoon edition of Power and Politics. We'll take a quick commercial break, but we'll be back with another round of our power panel right after this. This minority government gives us a chance to be able to fight for the things that we've laid out all along this campaign. It gives us a chance to, to let Canadians know that we, we understand the responsibility that's been given to us, that we are going to continue to make sure that government does not work for the powerful corporations at the very top, but works for people. I take this responsibility very seriously, and I'm going to work hard to deliver on this responsibility. Welcome back to a special post-election edition of Power and Politics. I'm Vashi Capellos, and we're talking through last night's federal election results with our power panel, Jason Markasoff, Francoise Boivin, David Ertel, Melissa Lansman, and Vicky Machama. Uh, that's a comment from Mr. Singh, Vicky, today looking towards what might ensue. Still big question mark about how this parliament and the makeup will end up working together. What are you looking for? How do you think the, the po like what kind of possibilities exist, if at all, for that? I think there's a lot of possibilities, but I think the 
tone of the election has it's very has potential to creep into how the House actually runs. Um, and that's not to say it was working at max capacity before this moment. I, <laughs> I think there was still always there was some tension between the various conservatives on the committees versus the liberals who got to just make decisions around them. And I think that's only going to get more expansive. I think that level of tension will now filter down into committees. You know, the committee that I tend to watch most has to do with prisons. And there had been not much movement there before. And I don't know that in a minority situation that, that there will be an increase in that. And so I think it, it's a challenging moment because there are a number of high stakes bills, um, especially I think around indigenous issues. This is where I'm most concerned about how this minority government will proceed with that because for the liberals it's a priority, but it's less so a priority for the conservatives. And I think the NDP have a very different stance on how they want to approach uh, issues around in, uh, indigenous concerns. And so the fact that this is the house that gets to decide this, you know, raises a lot of questions. The interpersonal dynamics, Melissa, were on full display right after the election last night when they all appeared at the same time to give their speeches. <laughs> sure, that made the was, networks happy. Oh, it was such a joy to, to experience that. But, I mean, even the tone and the tenor of every comment that they've essentially made since shows no sign of an maybe an acknowledgement that Canadians didn't love the what they were what, what they were what, what they were dealing with or the tone and instead is like almost a doubling down yeah. of the kind of rhetoric that we heard throughout the entire campaign we, we've had minorities before in this country yes. and, uh, sure and, and and they have worked you know Andrew Scheer goes to Ottawa with the largest uh, you know with the largest opposition in uh, in the history of the party he gets to prove to Canadians that he's a government in waiting with uh, Jagmeet Singh I'm actually not sure why we didn't hear the demands of the NDP it was a clear opportunity to put things on the table of I'm gonna hold the government to account on A, B, and C, and that's what we're going to get out of them. And for Justin Trudeau, this is going to be difficult because we've seen we've seen behavior over the last four years that doesn't suggest um, that he has the skills to uh, to do this. It, you know, the minority situation. It takes you know uh, brinksmanship, deal making, caucus relations. Uh, you don't. You have to look inward now, not be on the cover of uh, of, of Vanity Fair or an international rock star. So that's 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 going to be very different. It's going to change the dynamics of how powerful the prime minister minister's offices. It's going to change the dynamics on uh, in committee structures. There's a lot to watch. You don't just get to go to Ottawa and uh, and, and make decisions. You got to work with people. And I think that that's going to be difficult for a from a liberal prime minister that showed very little humility yesterday in uh, in his, you know, acceptance speech. Can I quickly follow up because you're the conservative on the panel? Uh, Andrew Scheer didn't show any humility either. Both of, both of them didn't, right? I mean, he's framed, and, and I take the way that you're framing it and the way he, that he's framing it. He still didn't win the most seats, even though he was saying he, that he would. He didn't and win that, the most seats, and for him, this is, I think, it's 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 a longer term play. Um, Do you think his leadership thought, is safe? That's that's what I wanted to ask you. I, you know, I think it, I think it's going to be difficult for for Andrew Scheer to show the rest of the Conservative Party, you know, how to grow that base beyond uh, beyond beyond the base that came out. Uh, I think he won more seats. He got 6.1 million votes is nothing to uh, to shun at. That's the largest in conservative history. Uh, but there's going to be a lot of uh, a lot of sort of inward uh, discussion about how the campaign ran. Uh, but at the end of the day, he's in a good spot uh, to be prime minister in two years. David, uh, when you look towards how this parliament might work or, or not work, what, what are you looking for? What kind of things do you anticipate? Well, I mean, when you look at, at, at this parliament, uh, the obvious is that the Liberals will, will seem to work with, with the NDP uh, to move forward. Uh, but in Quebec, I mean, they, basically the last remnants of the Jack Layton 2011 wave went to the bloc. And so, uh, because when you look at the percentages b compared to 2015, it's almost to the decimal point. Uh, exactly what transferred to the block. But yet again on this, where Bill 21 was a huge issue here in Quebec during the campaign and Francois Legault pushed very hard on this and was banking on some sort of conservative bloc uh, situation for, for the parliament, now we're in a situation where, uh, again, a big majority of Quebecers voted for parties that are openly against Bill 21. And, and that the bloc uh, didn't get to where it needed to get to be able to uh, make significant inroads in where Justin Trudeau wants to go. Now, Justin Trudeau needs to build bridges. 
that's, uh, that's another thing. I agree with Melissa on the point that he's going to have to look within the caucus. He's going to have to start negotiating. His staff is going to be very important. The people he brings in, the PMO, is going to be very important. There's going to have to be a Quebec lieutenant, there, which he refused to do in the, in the last mandate. But there's also going to have to be a conversation with, with Canadians. This has to be rebuilt because on the other side, the Conservatives don't have the type of message that works. We've seen it. It doesn't work in Ontario. It doesn't work uh, in Montreal. It doesn't work in the, in the rest of Quebec. And you need Quebec and Ontario to govern this country. So there's going to have to be something to, that's going to have to give here. And I think Justin Trudeau, as in a position to build and I hope that the tone that was shown last night during the speeches is going to evolve because he does have a clear mandate but it's not the clear mandate he seems to be talking about. Yeah, that's what I wanted to ask you. We just have a few seconds before I have to take another commercial. But on that idea of the, the same way, you know, Andrew Scheer was framing it in a certain way. So was Justin Trudeau. The idea that right away he said this is a clear signal that you didn't want no. conservative cuts and that this is a clear mandate. Like it, no, it kind of took me by surprise. It's not a clear mandate. It's not at all a clear mandate. When you, you go from almost 40% of the popular vote and four years later you're down to second place and 33% and you're in the minority government and you lose over 20 seats, that is not a clear mandate. And he has to work with other pe people. And that's also meaning working with his caucus. Remember, with the whole Wilson-Raybould affair, yeah. there was a lot of rumblings within the caucus. And so that brought out a lot of rumblings. And so. There's going to have to be work with the caucus. The Liberal MPs are going to have more power. Mm -hmm. And he's going to have to show that he can be uh, more of a team player within the Liberal caucus and also, you know, reach out to the country that did not go for the Liberal message. Okay, as I mentioned, uh, I do have to take another commercial break, but Francoise and Jason, we will get you in as soon as we come back. More Power Panel right after this. Special Power in Politics on this day after the big election. I will have to invite you to watch closely how the things will develop in the coming months. I expect us to have quite a good leverage. You will have the pleasure of discovering that
along the way, as we all will. Welcome back to an afternoon edition of Power and Politics, following, of course, last night's election results, which we are talking through with the Power Panel. Jason Markasoff, Francoise Boivin, David Ertel, Melissa Lansman, and Vicky Machama. Uh, Francoise, we left uh, the last break teeing, teeing up to you. And I, I wanted to actually bring in some of the questions we've been getting for people who are watching this on uh, social media, on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube, because there's a lot of questions about what we've been talking about, and that is the future of this parliament, the way in which it might or might not work. Work. And Marcel Marcotte on Facebook asks, will Mr. Scheer and Mr. Sting still be leaders of their parties in the next election? Mm. What do you think? Good question. Uh, for Mr. Singh, I'd be surprised that uh, the NDP will uh, let him go, even though it is a, a, a deception in a sense of number of seat. It's devastating to see the state of the party in, in my own province after the orange wave, but the fact that it had been worked uh, so hard from 2005 by Jack Layton and his team to build that uh, momentum toward a, a wave, and now it's all gone except for one, uh, one seat, uh, Alexandre Boulris. But... Mr. Singh had a good campaign. People liked him. I think uh, where Eric uh, Grenier was giving you some stats from, from, from the final numbers and, and, and you saw that the NDP uh, didn't deliver. They, they lost two, three points uh, in the last few days. I think it was the, 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 the prayer from the liberals saying, if you vote for them, I think it was really uh, the strategic voting that got into, into shape and, and probably uh, removed some 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 success in in Ontario. So I think they have a lot to to congratulate themselves, but they still have to face some very hard question as to what type of role they want to play in parliament. They want to go back to their good old days of being the conscience of parliament or they're a serious party that vie for for one day uh, after much rebuilding uh, 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 maybe be able to to contend for 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 government. Uh, so I think I think he's safe for a bit. As for Mr. Shear, like I said, I just don't, I can't picture in, 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 in the way he is, the way he campaigned with all the tools he had in his hand. How could you blow that, that, that election is beyond me. It took so long to answer to all the personal attacks and so on. So I think, uh, uh, except for those who are real big fans of Andrew Scheer, he will have to think long and hard uh, as, uh, if he's staying and if the, the base wants him still on. Jason, Alex, and I, I apologize for pronouncing this incorrectly, I'm sure. Sikergara asks, who is most likely to be Justin Trudeau's ally in the next parliament, the bloc or the NDP? I mean, I think, you know, naturally he doesn't want to be seen as uh, firm allies of uh, the Bloc Québécois. I mean, Justin Trudeau's in a uh, lucky position or a fortunate position that uh, he actually has more seats com than the NDP Greens and Conservatives combined. Uh, it's, a, it's a pretty healthy uh, sized ma uh, minority government. Um, so he only needs, uh, he only needs one party's uh, support at any given time. Uh, he can play, uh, play certain parties off each other. He may play... Uh, to the Conservatives to get support on some uh, pro-energy initiatives that'll uh, satisfy the West. He may uh, appeal to the uh, progressive, uh, not so much uh, Quebec first uh, edge of the bloc, but the progressive edge of the bloc. And uh, he'll woo uh, Jagmeet Singh somewhat on uh, on farm, you know, on ba taking baby steps towards uh, pharmacare. Maybe he'll bring in a tax for the rich. Probably not. Um, I don't think you're going to see a very ambitious um, liberal government. They'll just want to stick around, stay alive. And they'll also have the uh, other uh, cudgel in their uh, back pocket that, what, you want to hold an election now? You want to go to an election right away? Do you have the money? Do you have the resources? Do you think that Canadians will thank you for bringing them back to the polls? Um, with 150-some seats, uh, he, uh, he's pretty comfortable and can, uh, can play off what he wants. But I do, that said, I do agree that he does need to uh, not act that way, not act so, uh, not act so arrogant and uh, not uh, totally uh, parade around like he has a majority. Vicky, a question from Eamon Fathala on Facebook. Do we expect the Liberals will have to offer a cabinet minister or two to another party to secure support? I think this is a question that feeds into a lot of the conversations prior to the vote in the last week, mm -hmm. particularly around what might the eventuality be? Will it be a formal, and there's a big difference, a formal coalition, some type of agreement where they, where they, don't, they agree not to defeat the government, or just an issue-by-issue issue thing? My guess is, given the numbers, it's more going to be issue-by-issue, issue, but what do you think? Yeah, I think it's going to be issue-by-issue. Issue. I think because 
is solidifying it in, you know, whether it's with the Greens, with the NDP, with the Bloc, doesn't help Justin Trudeau in the long run. It doesn't help them with the next election coming up. I think it, you know, you know, only solidifies that Western alienation and allows disaffection to creep outwards. But I think going issue by issue allows the Liberals more room. For example, you know, looking at Atlantic Canada, it's not the liberal rosy picture that it was, but there are Greens, there are uh, NDP, there are Conservatives in there, and that gives them a chance to work with Atlantic MPs in a way that has almost nothing to do with party. And so he can, you know, break down systems that way. I think he also has the support of cities uh, outside of Alberta and... and, yeah, and there was a real rural-urban divide. Yeah, the cities election. really are. You know, if you look at the map, it looks strikingly blue, but if you you know, zoom in to where people, lots of people are in the cities, it is strikingly red. And so I think they can take advantage of those places and spaces and use that as an opportunity. But, you know, again, it remains to be seen. We've seen a bit more arrogance from the uh, Trudeau liberals. I think the test for me on what version of the Justin Trudeau minority government we're going to see is how they treat Jody Wilson-Raybould when she walks mm -hmm. into the House. I think that'll be a bellwether for how the other parties can expect Justin Trudeau to... I, but, I, have, I have just a minute left. 30 seconds to Melissa and David each. Your final thoughts, Melissa? Yeah, look, in terms of uh, a formal coalition, not a chance. He doesn't have to do it. He doesn't have to put that much water in his wine. He can do it issue uh, by issue. Uh, it's going to be interesting. Um, you know, I, well, Some people say interesting. I actually say expensive. Expensive. NDP and, uh, and, and liberal sort of coalitions are going to be very expensive and we'll see that deficit uh, uh, balloon and I think that that puts uh, conservatives on the map for next time around. Interesting. Uh, J uh, uh, David, last word to you. Well, the, the country is going to be feeling a progressive wind for the next 18 to 24 months, it seems. Uh, the remnants of 1972 and Pierre Elliott Trudeau. And so we'll see if it yields the same type of result afterwards. But like his father, uh, Justin is, seems destined to alienate the West and he has to change that cycle if we're gonna all move forward. All right, I wanna thank all of you for taking time out of your day and interrupting your afternoon for us. We really appreciate your time and your very valuable insights. Thanks to our power panel, David Ortel, Vicky Mochama, Melissa Lansman, Francoise Boivin, and Jason Markasoff. You are watching Power and Politics on CBC News Network. We're back in a moment, stay with us. Welcome back to a special post-election edition of Power and Politics. Last night, the Liberals lost their majority in Ottawa. They were reduced to a minority, which means Parliament Hill could be mired in political uncertainty. And when it comes to economic stability, uncertainty is kind of a bad word. So for more on the fallout of last night's results, I'm joined by CBC's senior business correspondent, Peter Armstrong. Hi, Peter. Hey, Vash. Hey, how are you? Let's good. Thank you. And yourself. I'm all right. <laughs> I'm, I mean, I'm really interested by this. Yeah. And I, like, I get the sort of 
tactics and strategy question about what happened last night, what happens, but I, I, I'm really interested in what did these results tell us? And Let's pull up the map just to, yeah. so our viewers can, can share with us in, in what those results were because we've got the Liberals reduced to a minority of 157 seats, a strong minority, but still yeah. a minority. Conservatives at 121, the Bloc at 32. Over in Quebec, New Democrats uh, held 24 seats, which was a decrease for them. The Greens at three, and Jody wilson rambled as an independent over in Vancouver, Granville. When you look at that map, what does it tell you? Well, that we're divided. And then I think if you even zoom out and look at the, the map of Canada and how divided it is, I think it tells us and there it is. A, a political expression of an economic reality that you and I have been talking about for months now, that we don't really understand one another in this country. And, you know, I did that piece a little while ago about, you know, the, the two thirds of Canadians make less than $46,000 a year, that the, the most common job among Canadian men is truck driver and the most common job among Canadian women is retail sales, that I, I don't think we really, we hear that, but we don't really process it. We don't really think about how does that fit with me and my community and the people I talk to every day? And how do I, how do I better understand Canada? Well, you better understand Canada by looking at those numbers. And, and I think what we had been talking about in terms of not really knowing one another through those, those economic conditions is really, has been really effectively expressed through the political reality that we saw last night. And you can see it laid bare when you look at that map of Canada. And, you know, not, not to sort of dwell on the numbers here, but you look at GDP growth in Canada, it's doing pretty good in, you know, BC and in Newfoundland this year and Quebec and to a lesser degree Ontario, but you look at Alberta and New Brunswick and Nova Scotia and they're really struggling. And while guys like me come on the radio and TV all the time and talk about, you know, the macro data says the economy is actually doing really well, and it is, it, it's so important to highlight how bad it is in the places that it is bad and how that is, is, is an economic expression of a political reality as Do well. Do you think because it's a minority that that will be better reflected in the decisions that this parliament, however it comes to those decisions, ends up making? Well, I don't know. I mean, the last time I covered politics was the end of Paul Martin's minority and the beginning of Stephen Harper's minority. And I don't think those issues and the policy issues that would address them became as front and center as I think even people then had expected them to. You know, the, the Martin's minority didn't get very much done and Stephen Harper's minority got so very little done that they turned, you know, we must have a conservative stable majority, whatever the, the line was. That was that, that became their campaign slogan. Because Although they would they argue so they, they stu stuck around, you know, they had a five year minority where they, they were able to govern they issue were. by and, issue, and, and but was, yeah, but you're right. Then, then they made that argument, you need us to be a strong You gotta have, and, and, and I worry that we'll go back to that again. And I think that if you look at the economic data, where are we as a country? What does each region need to do to sort of catch up to the mean? I mean, the mean's only 1.6 in terms of GDP growth this year. We can, we can take measures to, to help the parts of the country that need that economic boost. Uh, and I'm hoping that when, when, when all parties sort of look at that map and look at the economic reality and, and say, what can we do to address that rather than what can we do to sort of focus on tactics and strategy of dealing with the chaos of our House of Commons in, in a minority situation. We shall see. Thank you, Peter. Nice you. CBC's business, chief business correspondent, Peter Armstrong. Stay with us. Power and Politics is back in two minutes.
Canadians woke up today to a shifted political landscape. The Liberals are still in power, but they now hold a minority. The Conservatives increased their seat count but remain official opposition. A surge in support for the Bloc Québécois reduced the number of seats for the NDP. Here's how some of the political, res political leaders rather, responded today. The responsibility of the Prime Minister and the Liberal Party is to make this Parliament work. It is their responsibility, not ours, not the responsibility of the NDP or the Conservative. Mr. Trudeau has this duty. I can let you know this. The New Democratic Party will be constructive, will respect the choices that Canadians have made, and will approach building the new parliament with open minds and an open heart. We will keep holding Justin Trudeau to account and we will keep fighting for our values and principles, for our freedoms and our prosperity. And we will be ready when the time comes and his government falls to take the fight back to Justin Trudeau and give Canadians the government they deserve. And that is it for this early post-election edition of Power in Politics. I'm Vashi Cavellos. We're back at 5 o'clock Eastern for more coverage. Lots more ahead. Stay with us.